Welcome back to another episode of the Max Term Podcast. Kyle Stitch here alongside James Finch. And today we are starting a division by division rundown of the NHL in the season preview. Hard to believe, but the NHL season is just a month around the corner. And we are going to go through the East, followed by the West, kind of give a rundown of where each team stands give a level of our prediction, looking at some over-under point totals for each team, some maybe under-the-radar players, and uh, just kind of a general discussion on how we feel about each team going into the season. If you uh, are interested in our work, have any questions, you can follow us on Twitter, now X, at AFP Analytics. Our personal accounts can also be found through there. We appreciate you listening to this podcast and subscribing to Max Term Podcast on any of the major platforms that you might use. And uh, this episode, we're going to be referencing some betting odds. Those are pulled from a site, but we are not necessarily in working with or endorsing any betting site or any other products that you might hear associated with this episode. And again, I'm just going to reiterate these odds were pulled from a site, and that's all we're going to say, not giving any free publicity. If you do want to give us some publicity, let us know. Uh, and with that, let's get started with the Metropolitan Division. We're going to run down, uh, I guess, from the bottom up kind of point total as well as kind of our own little feelings a little bit. So we're going to start with the Philadelphia Flyers, whose over-under point total is sitting at 73.5. The Flyers kind of had a kind of came to terms with a level of rebuild this offseason. So be interesting to kind of see where they end up shaking out. But I think we both are kind of in agreement where where we lean with Philadelphia here. Yeah, so I guess uh, to begin, I'm going to ask you a question. Who do you think is going to be a top pair defenseman for the Philadelphia Flyers this year who really should not be? Uh, anyone on their roster. All right. I mean, I was kind of zeroing in on Rasmus versus the line, and he's probably going to see the ice a bit more like he used to in Buffalo. This is one, so you mentioned we're, we're at a uh, 73 and a half for the over-under uh, on the point total. And personally, I look at the situation and even the few good players that they've got, it doesn't tilt the scale enough for me. I'm, I'm going to take the under for Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, another quick uh, disclaimer, caveat, whatever you want to say, like we're, we're providing our opinion. We're not necessarily modeling this here. So if you value our opinion, you want to use it great, but uh, don't, don't take our, our opinion as kind of absolute fact. And I, uh, bet money or put anything that you're uncomfortable losing or, you know, come back at us. This is just kind of us having a little fun with kind of where we see things. But yeah, I also would be the under. I Their forward group could be kind of sneaky decent. But but yeah, the, the defense, I mean, Sean Walker was, was a decent pickup. Maybe Cam York can take a step forward. Sandheim's fine to good but then what as you said wrist line in, and then the other one that I was going to kind of say tongue-in-cheek for that question was Mark Stahl as well those are two guys that are probably going to play more than going to help the Flyers and then even kind of working back from the defense to the goalie situation Carter Hart's been up and down in his career. Cal Peterson, really the same thing. And then it's the question of, will like a Felix Sandstrom see the net a lot? Little, they have Sam Arison as well, in the who should be in the AHL. But I guess, I guess seeing where that goalie tandem trio quad kind of kind of plays out will be will be a go a long way to determining how successful or unsuccessful of a season they might have. Yeah, I definitely agree. There's a lot of questions there with the goalies. Um, and the other thing to point out, I, I want to touch on, because you mentioned the forward group could be a little sneaky, and I agree. But at the same time, there's a couple of really big question marks, I think. Sean Couturier, 
is he going to be the same player when he comes back, coming off a big injury? Also, Cam Atkinson coming off uh, injury. Those are two guys who you'd expect to be top six players, um, producing pretty well for you. So I, I'm hesitant to lean one way or the other that the forward group might actually look a little bit better um, than initially perceived. I think there's a lot of question marks there. Yeah, and that's even assuming Couturier comes back and yeah. is playing meaningful games, meaningful minutes. I, I, I sure hope that's the case, but with with where things have trended for him, I, I'm not comfortable sitting here and even counting on him playing a game for the Flyers this season. Atkinson's older, 34, coming off an injury. That's That's not a player that I'm expecting to really move the needle much. They, they have some interesting, they could have a really interesting third line centered around like a Scott Lawton and Garnett Hathaway. That would be a really good matchup shutdown line. So maybe if they can jump out to some leads, they might be able to shut some games down to an extent because they, they have some nice two-way players. Even Travis Konecki is a nice two-way player as well. But I think, but still, that defense and that goalie situation, I just don't know if I can get past that. Yeah, I think I think overall, we kind of, I think we both really agree here that, like, there's a couple bright spots here and there on this roster, but we, we don't think it's really going to be enough to, um, well, really put them over a 73.5 point total. And I think one thing that's also very important, like kind of thinking about where they're going to fall in the final standings is they show this offseason they're willing to rebuild, retool, whatever you want to call it. They're willing to sell. And a team like them that's probably going to be out of contention by the time the new year rolls around, definitely by the trade deadline, that's they could take a nosedive kind of in the second half of the season, tail end of the season, because there's some guys like Travis Konecki, Scott Law, and probably the top two names that have been in the rumor mill all summer and still are on the team. But those are two guys that easily could be moved out at a trade deadline or even a little bit before. Yeah, and to add on to that, um, there were some decent rumors about Carter Hart who would presumably be their number one goaltender. Um, similar situation, if it gets to a point where they're out of contention, they could possibly move him. And yeah, then the goalie situation looks even a little more, uh, a little more thin. Um, so yeah, I think it is important to look at kind of what the plan is for each team uh, during the season. Yeah, with the Flyers, uh, not tanking, but pretty much understanding that they're going to go downhill a little bit before they start moving back uphill. Um, that's another factor that kind of goes into our uh, our choosing of the under of 73.5. Any players on looking at their roster that you could see maybe being a sneaky offensive contributor, maybe take a step forward or anything for maybe people looking in deeper like fantasy leagues or just kind of seeing who, who could be a name to keep an eye on? Yeah, so I'm going to actually give two names, uh, and it's going to be a couple centers. With the uncertainty about Sean Couturier, I think Noah Cates had a fairly sneaky um, sneaky past year. Um more of a third line role, but he might have a little more opportunity. And the same goes for Morgan Frost, who should also have that similar opportunity to play possibly top six minutes. And I think those two centers, if you end up on a line with a Travis Konecki, a Joel Farabee, there's going to be potential for a little bit more of an offensive output. I might go with the kind of obvious answer here, but Travis Konecki, He's going to get the opportunities, power play minutes, top line minutes. And also, again, he 
could be on another team by the halfway to later portion of the season where he, you would think, would put up even better numbers, potentially. Yeah, so with him, I think it's important he to mention he was a point-per-game player last year, and the, the Flyers were not good last year either. So I would expect more of the same kind of level of output, at least, from him. And like you said, if he were to end up somewhere with a contender, a much stronger roster, those numbers could even increase. Yeah, and again, um, bringing in like a Hathaway as, as kind of, I mean, he was probably their big offseason addition, him and Sean Walker, Mark Stahl. I mean, these aren't super moving the needles, but Hathaway's a really good defensive kind of player. So Konecki could be freed up from having to do a level of that responsibility, which could allow him to play a little bit more of an offensive game that now they have Lawton, uh, like a, a third line of Lawton and, um, and Hathaway here, like that's that's a really solid solid defensive line that <clears throat> that I think a lot of teams would envy having, and who knows, maybe some teams will be looking to acquire those players, both of those players, at later in the season at the deadline. Yeah, I mean, I I would be if I was a contender for sure. So I think we're both we're both thinking Philadelphia is finishing probably eighth in this division, probably under seventy three and a half. They could they could get close. They could maybe sneak a little past it, but I think they need a lot to go right. And I I don't know their their depth. If someone gets hurt up front, and then if one of like a Sandheim gets hurt on the blue line, they're they're in big trouble. It or or Carter Hart in goal or. We're still waiting on a resolution with the Canadian junior situation and who, I mean, I don't want to speculate by any means, but that's still out there and Carter Hart was part of that team. And I think I'll leave it at that. So there's, there's always going to be uncertainty until a clear resolutions there. So Philadelphia probably finishes last, probably takes a step back. And I think they're okay with that. And I think that, to me, is the difference between them and the next team uh, kind of working up. And that's the Columbus Blue Jackets. Same point total. I'm a big fan of an over 73.5 points. I think Columbus is, okay, I don't know if they're necessarily going to win now, but I think they're more in a win-now mode, which matters when all said and done as well. Yeah, so from a just a mindset, uh, they seem to be much more interested in winning now um, in comparison to, let's say, the Flyers. Um, I'm a little hesitant with 73 and a half. I don't know if that is um, something I would personally um, decide to make any financial decisions with. Um, my hesitancy is their defense has not been very good in recent years. Um, now, last year, Wierenski missed the majority of the season, and he's their clear top guy. Um, they also added Damon Severson, who I think is a clear top four defenseman. Um, that's really going to help. I don't know if a change of scenery for uh, Provorov is going to all of a sudden make him good again. But if it does, then we're we're kind of talking here. Columbus has uh, really a real solid core defensively, if that's the case. I just, I, I don't know. I, I feel really hesitant with their defense. And then I think their defense has really impacted who is considered their number one goalie, Merz Lickens. He was not good last year. That's a real big question mark. He has been good in the past, so maybe there's a rebound there. Yeah, I think I think looking at their defense, and we'll get, I mean, it'll be a similar theme when we get a little later in the division with the New York Rangers. They also have on defense some interesting young players that if they take a step forward, suddenly that defensive core looks a lot better. I'm looking at Adam Boquist and maybe a Jake Bean in particular. If those two players can take a step forward, like Boquist was a high draft pick and 
you would think, and you're starting to come in right around that age when defensemen start to really find their own 23, 24, 25 years old. Again, Jake being in the same, a little bit older, but if one of those two guys can kind of help fill out a top four with Orensky and Severson, maybe stabilize Provorov, like, we could be talking a little bit more. Merzlikens is definitely need, need to stop. Need him to step back up again because he, yeah, he was not good last year. I my memory of him is just getting lit up by Tage Thompson in the first period uh, on that TNT game, and that's I think that was Merzlikens who played, or he came in afterwards. I, I forget who played what, but I just remember Columbus couldn't do anything, and Thompson had five goals in that game was over in just the first period and that was I don't know that's that's my memory of Columbus but everything went wrong last year for them that I think possibly could have yeah so I, I'm gonna read off a handful of names here who were all um, not, not uh, full-time players but they all had at least 24 games and uh, into the 30s, into the 50s, as far as games played. Nick Blankenberg, Tim Burney, Marcus Bjork, and Jacob Christensen. Those are all defensemen who played at least 24 games for the Columbus Blue Jackets. Not to hate on any of those players, but they're all projected to be in the AHL this season. Um, that's part of what makes me think Okay, maybe I can believe a little bit more in Merzlikens as a goalie. Um, they've improved the defense this offseason. There should be better play in front of them. So maybe that's not quite as much of an issue as it was last year. So I, that's me trying to be optimistic. Going to the forward group. Um, that's where we know like they, they are trying to win. They signed Johnny Goudreau last year. You don't do that if you're not trying to win games. Um, Patrick Laine um, isn't... I, I don't think he is what everyone thought he was going to be, but he's still a, a pretty solid offensive player at about a point per game. I think the big question is the, the young players. There's a few young centers that could really take a step and be impactful. Um, there's one specifically that you mentioned. Uh, they just drafted him this year. Yeah, I I mean, they're looking for a big step from Adam Fantilli here. Um, they want him to ideally come in and anchor that first line. That might be a little optimistic. But him and Kent Johnson and Cole Sillinger are all nice. Like, they were good. They're good prospects. Um, yeah that could be a really good one, two, three down the middle. Maybe not immediately, but you would think that Columbus finally has some center ability, but I wouldn't put it past Fantilli to come in and, okay, I'm not going to say superstar, but he, he could be, he could be a top line player. Like we watched Jack Eichel come into the league with the Sabres. I think that's probably a good, fair comparison. Like, Michael was sheltered a little bit, and Columbus could do the same with Fantilli, but he still generated offense, still helps the team score goals. I think that's what you're kind of hoping Fantilli is able to do, maybe start on the third line, get get some center minutes, maybe a few in the wing to play tougher competition at the start of the season. Then as, as the kind of season progresses, you want to see him hopefully start to take one of those uh, top two spots. I think the question if that happens, who who else who kind of fills up the top half of their lineup in that situation? Yeah, you know, so Boone Jenner is probably going to at least start in that top six at the beginning of the year. Um, I think in a perfect world he'd be a third line forward. Um, that's kind of where you want Fantilli to end up is in Boone Jenner's spot. Um, You've got Goudreau on the wing, Patrick Lyon on the wing. Kent Johnson is kind of, he's a center prospect. It wouldn't shock me if he ended up on the wing because so we've mentioned Fantilli. There's also Boone Jenner. There's Jack Roslovich. 
There's uh, Cole Sillinger, who could uh, make his way into the lineup at some point next year. Some of these centers are going to have to play on the wing. Um, it's a kind of a question of who. Um, I think the thing to point out here with Columbus is there's a lot of younger players who are question marks, but any one of them could kind of step up and be that presence in the top six that they haven't had of a top offensive center. I think I think it's this is the first time looking at kind of Columbus's roster and thinking that they have players with the pedigree to be those top to be true top six forwards, particularly centers. And I don't want to gloss over. Um, I mean, he he's probably more of a middle six player, but Alex Tex, Tessier is back as well in the fold, and he's he's a really good role player for in the past at least for the Blue Jackets. So. Is, is he alone pushing them forward? Absolutely not. But just as we're talking about all these good forwards they have, I, I think skipping over his name and with him being back, I think I think that ha- has to be said as well. And I also think Columbus, I mean, we can we can put some photos up on the screen or whatever, but they have a good coach. No. <laughs> or at least should have an improvement in coaching. Yeah, I... I... Personally, I don't know for sure um, if I would say that. Not necessarily that the coach isn't better, but I still wonder about the fit for certain players, and I, I think that situation you referenced also kind of makes me wonder even a little bit more about the fit for certain players. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I, I Yeah, I mean, I think that the that maybe the league's passed Mike Babcock by a little bit, but he's still one of the more successful coaches in NHL history and taking over for a torts into Brad Larson team. I think that's, I think that's a step up and I think he should get more out of this lineup, especially if they're healthy. So the, all that plus again, the fact that they're, they're looking to win now. I, I like them I like them beating that 73 and a half because I really think a lot would have to go wrong again for them to consider selling in the second half of the season. Yeah, you know, I I think I'm going to say you've convinced me. I think I'd take the over. I worry a little bit. I think that there's a lot that would need to really go right for them, but at the same time, there's last year a lot went wrong, and I think if they even end up a little bit in the middle of those two extremes, they're they're probably better than seventy three and a half. I don't know if they get to like up to eighty, but I could definitely see higher seventies um, from this team for sure. I, I think I think a little of the hesitancy that we were talking kind of before we we started recording here is. Really, the East in general is is strong. Like, there's not the weaker teams are the Philadelphia's, the Columbus's, Montreal, and then after that, we're talking about Washington and Detroit. Maybe like like we're starting to really push it here. So Columbus having to play the majority of their games against against the East and in the Metropolitan Division in particular is makes it a little bit harder. I think if they were in like the Central Division, I'd feel very comfortable saying over is almost a lock, but yeah. but but just just the schedule and everything that Columbus is going to be facing, little hesitancy, but I still I still like the over. And then so moving on to the team that I kind of referenced just there that might be one of the weaker ones. Washington Capitals over under set 85 and a half points. They had an interesting kind of approach last as last season was kind of coming to an end. They, I would, I would say retooled. I think that's the best way to put it because they sent some, some veterans out, but also brought um, some players in as well to kind of try to balance out everything. But the reality is, is they're, core is aging they still have Backstrom they still have Ovechkin they still have Oshie still have Kuznetsov 
and they're going to have Tom Wilson for a very, very long time at this point. Decent goaltending situation, decent blue line situation, but their forward group's aging, and really everything in Washington the next two years are going to be about Ovechkin's pursuit of the goal record. Yeah, so what what is tough with Washington is the age and health of some players. So, I mean, we, we even saw Ovechkin miss a, a handful of games, two handfuls. He played 73 last year. Um, not terrible, but as I run down this list, Tom Wilson played 33. Uh, TJ Oshie, 58. Backstrom, 39. And even move to the defensive side, Carlson, 40. If Washington wants to be a contender, they're going to need better health out of their older players. But at the same time, those are also their star players that um, if they want to contend, those players need to be on the ice. Um, that being said, Backstrom's 35. He's kind of had some injury issues the past handful of seasons. Does that just get better and he's back to playing, let's say, 80 games next year? I I don't know if I'm confident in that. Tom Wilson is younger. He's 29, but the style of a game he plays, he's going to just naturally be a little more injury prone. Like you said, this season for Washington might really just turn into the Alex Ovechkin let's see how many goals he can score and how close he can get to that record because if this is anything like it is it is last like it was last year I I honestly think they're a fringe team and they might miss the playoffs yeah I I would be even more comfortable than saying a fringe team I don't I, I mean, I'm, I can't say confidently because they do still that star power, but just looking at the, the other teams in the division and conference, I, I think that they're one of the weaker teams, which is, I, I don't like saying that they're like a bottom four, bottom five team in the East because that seems extreme. But the East is just, there's a lot of teams on the rise now. And it, as you were just going through, like their top six, Ovechkin, Backstrom, Kuznetsov, Oshi, Wilson, Mantha will make the sixth at this point. But, like, all of those guys have had significant injury. Ovechkin stayed relatively healthy, but there's been injuries there. So, expecting to get a full season from them just doesn't feel likely. And then, yes, their AHL affiliate won the Calder Cup in um, this past year, but... There's not a ton of like super exciting prospects. They, they pretty much it's like Hendrix Lapierre. Um, that that's kind of who could help them. At maybe a average to better than average level. Yeah. Lapierre, maybe a Connor McMichael, Evan Mirashenko. Is is an in, like he was an interesting prospect. Um, I don't think he's going to be necessarily over in North America right now, but he, I mean, he's he's probably their best pipeline outside of this year's kind of draft. Um, at least that forward. I like Alexi Prodas a lot as a kind of middle to bottom six player, but he's more of a role guy. So I don't know Washington. I mean, their defense, Fairby, Sandin are nice young players. But then, as you said, it's it's John Carlson still probably their best guy. And everyone else is getting up there in age as well. And they're really more of second to third pair guys. Yeah, I think this is just a team that is slowly on the decline. I don't want to say the window's closed, but... It's it's getting there. I, I think if your fingers are hanging out the window, you need to pull them in because uh, I I just I don't see age wise and injury wise um, 
that this team can really improve enough this season off of last to really make any sort of dent in a playoff race. Um, so we, we mentioned 85 and a half. We've kind of talked about this earlier. I feel like I'm, I'm taking the under. I feel like you kind of have to. Yeah, I I mean, it's close. I, I'm also looking at the kind of through, I got Cat Friendly open in front of me, great, great resource site. I completely forgot they signed Max Pacioretty in this offseason. So. Which could be great, but that's, again, another huge question mark, injury-wise and age, uh, any way you want to look at it. Yeah, I mean, so sure, Washington could be a sneaky contender, but I, I just I don't see it. I re- I think I think it really comes down to at least where their final point total sits is how how willing they are to sell in the second half of the season. I think that's gonna. But like, I think if they kind of just roll through the season, see what happens, focus on Ovi potentially getting close to the record, they could have. Approach that 85, 86 point mark. But if they start shipping out a couple guys, have a couple injuries, I think I, I see them more as an 80 to 82 point team, I think, realistically. Yeah, and I think it's kind of going to be tough. And I almost want to say that that uh, situation of Ovi trying to score might impact that trade deadline decision. In the off season, there were a little bit of rumors around someone like Kuznetsov, who really, if Ovechkin's going to be scoring goals, he's going to need someone feeding him the puck, and that's Kuznetsov. If he's gone, I'm not saying Dylan Strom can't do it. Backstrom probably could do it if he's healthy. Um but I, I'm not sure the team's at the point where they want to go and kind of signal, okay, we're, we're done. Um, especially with Ovechkin chasing that record. Yeah. I, yeah, Washington, I, I would feel comfortable. I don't know. I, there, I would lean the under as we talk through it. I'm a little less comfortable, but I, I think they're right around. They're probably in the mid, low to mid 80 point wise. Again, injuries is the big question mark. Then another team that I'm never going to feel comfortable with, whatever I think about them. Jeff, I always think I feel real comfortable betting the under before the season starts and then get burned every single time. New York Islanders are... So there's a pretty kind of bottom three in the Metro, and then there's really five teams that that point total-wise at least preseason over under wise could be playoff teams starting with the New York Islanders at 91 and a half points. Yeah. So Islanders are one of those teams where you, you never think they're going to be as good as they are. And they surprise every year uh, looking at 91 and a half. Very initially, if I don't give myself a chance to think I'm like, there's no way the Islanders get there, but there is a way. And I think maybe we're kind of learning just from the past handful of years that the Islanders are actually a better team than we think. Part of that being they're not usually a huge offensive superpower. They're kind of the opposite. They're a defensive superpower. Um, And that's not as exciting. We don't think they're going to score enough. They're not going to win enough, but... They find a way to do it, usually. Um, that being said, I'm acknowledging that whole situation. I'm really struggling with 91 and a half. I mean, it really comes down to how well does Ilya Sorokin play. I, that, that's that's the question. Like, if he has another season like he did last year, I, I think they could, they'll be right there again. I, I mean, just looking at their roster, it's... It's the same as as it is always. Their centers have gotten better. Like Barzell and Horvat as a one two is is good. That's good. Um, Anders Lee is still a pretty good top six winger. He's I mean one of the best net front players in the game still. But then once you start getting past those names at 
forward. They have a lot of nice role players, but where's the scoring coming from? Um, I'm going to say it needs to come from Matthew Barzal. Um, the line he finished with by the end of the season wasn't bad, 51 points in 58 games. I think, if I'm remembering correctly, it took him a while to get going. I think they really need to see the um, really elite offensive play from him again. I, th I think that's where it comes from. It's, it's not going to be someone working up the lineup. It's all the same guys that we've seen past years with the Islanders. The one area I think that could be improved is Matthew Barzal. Um, we've seen it before with him. Last year was a little bit down. Um, we didn't see that step forward for what you would hope is your top line center. Um, I, I think that's where the opportunity is for them to be better offensively is bars off. <laughs> that's not, a, that's not a real great, like that shouldn't be a real inspiring answer here by any means. It isn't, but I mean, you look at their bottom six and you mentioned this, but if we want to go more specifically, Hudson fashing, uh, JG Peugeot, Wallstrom, maybe he as a prospect initially was, Highly regarded. Haven't quite seen that. Um, so maybe, I mean, he's still just 23. I guess that could be a player they look at as uh, maybe taking another step, but moving one more line down, most likely. Fourth line, Matt Martin, Casey Sezikis, Cal Clutterbuck. That's the fourth line. There's nothing changing there with those guys. Um, unless one of them takes a step down. Um there's not a top offensive prospect coming for them uh, uh, it, as a forward or a defenseman who's offensively gifted. It, there's Matthew Barzal, and I guess I talked myself into possibly Oliver Wallstrom maybe taking a step, but there's just it, this is the same exact team as it was last year. Yeah. I, again, it really breaks down to they've – three guys that I feel comfortable saying will produce offense, Barzell, Horvat, Lee. And I don't even think Horvat's going to produce at the same, at least season total that he had last year. Like he, yeah. he he's, he's due for a level of regression. I mean, yes. I have no problem with him on, on my second line by any means as my second line center, but who who's joining him on that second line and who's even playing, who's that third player on the first line, like Brock, Nelson, Kyle Palmieri, Pierre Ingolf, Oliver Wallstrom, like... That's so... One of those players is another one I want to point out. Brock Nelson had pretty much a career year last year. I mean, he's a very good player. I don't know if he's going for 36 goals, 39 assists again. I guess it could happen, but... We, we talk about Horvat probably being due for some regression. I think Brock Nelson as well is definitely due for a little bit of regression. We keep saying it. I, I don't know really where the improvement offensively comes from, which leads right back to what you said more towards the beginning um, discussing the Islanders. This is probably going to come down to is Sorokin able to have another Vesna caliber season. Yeah, it. I mean, they're blue, so it's not just Sorokin. The Islanders' blue line's pretty decent, pretty, pretty, pretty darn solid. I, I at least from a defensive, very yes, very good. Yes. yes, from a defensive standpoint. So if they can get a lead, the Islanders are going to be able to shut the door, shut shut other teams down. It's just the question: Can they get that lead? Yeah. Yep. So I mean, that ninety-one and a half. I. Every year, I, I think I'm going to bet the under. I'll probably do it again this year, foolishly. But I, I it's it's so tough because I, I wouldn't be surprised. And, again, the thing I keep wanting to harp on is, especially when you're talking these over-under point totals, like where you're kind of close, it really matters what their mindset's going to be going into the deadline. And the Islanders are not selling. Like, 
Lou, if anything, he's going to do another, add another piece at the deadline and then sign him to some ridiculous long-term contract. But they're not selling, so they're going to probably bank points throughout the entire season with their with their same forward forward defensive group and that that sometimes just spells trouble if you're if you're looking to, for the under to hit on a team that's proven that they're a 90 point team so I don't know it's it's close to me I I probably will foolishly still go on and bend under with them but and then probably lose that money but that's okay I I'm going to say it we're on the record. This is our podcast. New York Islanders over 91 and a half. Um, and because I said that, and because that's my opinion this year, this will be the year that they don't live up to that expectation. That's just how it's going to be probably. But I, I look at the rest of the division. We've covered three teams already there. And we've said, well, I've said, under, over, under. Some of the teams to come, I think there could be a little bit of under, in my opinion. So I, I'm going to say the Islanders sneak a couple more wins in there than, uh, than this 91 and a half. So over for me. Yeah, I and I think one of the teams, I mean, probably the next two teams are the ones that you were alluding to. Ne- next on the kind of at least the projected point total, Pittsburgh Penguins, 97 and a half. Big, big move was getting Eric Carlson. Um, still have Crosby, Malkin, Chris Letang. I, I think they had a really good offseason. I don't want to dismiss adding Ryan Graves as well. So I think their defensive core is a lot better. Um, offensively, offensive depth, Riley Smith in, Jason Zucker out. I don't know if that's a massive improvement, but the reality is they still have Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin as their top two centers. Yeah, so the, the question I have with Pittsburgh at this point, and I think a lot of people probably ask the same question is when is the uh, age of some of their stars going to really catch up to them? Um, There were questions about Malkin and his health. He played 82 games last year. Crosby, 82 games. A little bit of a question mark, Chris Letang, but he also doesn't have to be the number one anymore on this team. That's just naturally going to be Eric Carlson, who I think there were questions about is health an issue for him? Is he kind of past his prime, but then he puts up a Norris season. So I struggle because I'm like, at some point they have to age and decline. They haven't yet. Um, I agree with you that I think they had a really good offseason. I think in general the roster is improved. I don't know if I can take an over 97 and a half, though. Yeah, I mean, I think Pittsburgh's right there. Their blue line, I mean, a top four of Eric Carlson, some combination of Carlson, Latang, Ryan Graves, Marcus Pedersen is better than they've rolled out in years years. Yes. Tristan Jari is not without his flaws, staying healthy being maybe the top one. And but I like him generally as a goalie. Good defensive, probably better defensive play in front of him should help, but again as as we've been saying the the age of these players and it's not to say that they can't still be a playoff team. I like them a lot more as a potential playoff team this year than I did last year. But when we're ta- when we're kind of getting into like a thin margin of error here for a point total and maybe they rest Crosby or he just is banged up or Malkin banged up for a couple games, like that's that's tough to to really say and then again we've been we've said it earlier like the East is not easy, so taking every point's going to be 
tough to come by. I I could see them settling right at like 96 points, which would be right under. But that's a win away from also being 98 and hitting the over. So they, they would be one if, if I have to, if you're telling me I have to do it, think I lean under, but I might uh, I might stay away from this one. So, yeah, this is not a comfortable one whatsoever, but I'm going to give you the reason I'm under. I'm going to say this is my reason, Pittsburgh, under 97.5. I initially went through talking about their old star players eventually need to decline. Are they going to get hurt? At some point, that's going to happen. Jake Gensel is not one of their old players. He's 28 years old. But he's injured, probably going to miss a few months at the start of the season. As of right now, while we're doing this, I have cap friendly pulled up. I'm looking at the projected depth charts. Riley Smith is on the top line with Crosby. Okay, that's fine initially. Moving to the second line, Malkin at center, Ricard Raquel on the right wing. All right, that's fine. Nothing wrong there. Matt Nieto on the left wing. Looking at the third and fourth line, um, it's very clear third and fourth line players. No one that should really be jumping up into the top six. I don't know if there's really a prospect ready. A um, handful of years ago, Samuel Poulin. They drafted first round. I don't know if, even if he is ready, I don't think he's going right up into the top six. I think missing Gensel at the beginning of the season, possibly even the first half of the season, is going to hurt them a bit offensively. And I think they're still a playoff team. I don't think they get to 97.5, and, and that's my reason. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been the, the one maybe over – over like reading into statements and stuff about Jake Gatsel, but I've been the one saying I, I I'm a little worried about that ankle injury, and I mean the the other kind of player that maybe could play a top six role, Alex Nylander. I mean the the po- skill and potential has always been there, but it he's never been able to put it together. Me maybe finally he does that like. I guess looking at all the names, he's the one that I'd be most likely to roll those dice on. But I mean, you could test it out and try it. I, I think they. I don't know. I mean, I guess you can have Matt Nieto on the wing. Um, I don't think he's a top six player by any means, but that that spot is going to be. I'm going to say it, there's a pretty decent chance that's an issue for a large chunk of the season. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's... Yeah, I mean, they they, they did get better depth-wise, and I think their yeah. defensive game and their goaltending in general should be better, so they should allow fewer goals, so maybe that takes a little pressure off the offense, but I, I, I think I kind of agree with you on the under. Again, I don't feel comfortable, but... And I just hate I hate betting against four superstars now. Like, yeah, I, betting against Carlson, Crosby, Malkin, and Latang. Just I don't know that that also doesn't feel quite right either. But yeah, it's tough. Uh, Carlson being added there is probably going to make Gensel being gone hurt a little bit less, just with the offensive ability he brings. Um, and Latang is going to be able to. Shift down a pair, probably get a little bit easier competition. Um, that'll help him. It, it is a very, very tough one. I, I still lean under, but yeah, it, it's not one you're comfortable betting. So another one that I don't know how comfortable I am either way is New York Rangers, 105 points. One of the best goalies in the world in Igor Shosturkin. Some of, like... Arguably one of the best defensemen in the world, Adam Fox. A really solid ascending young defenseman in Keandre Miller. Added a guy you like in Eric Gustafson. They got Truba, Braden Schneider. 
um, a really solid Ryan Lindgren that plays with Fox. Like their blue line has potential to be really good. Shesterkin, if he can get back to where he was two years ago, was I mean he's a Venza caliber goalie. Bring in Jonathan Quick as his backup, so Shesterkin better play, stay healthy and play well. Um, and then up front, it's it's the same theme really with them. They added a couple of veterans this year, Blake Wheeler, Nick Bonino. Maybe that improves the depth in their offensive output, but it really is coming down to, once again, can these young players take a step forward? And so far, that has not happened. Yeah, so we saw last year uh, trade deadline. They identified, and I think this was correct, they needed to add scoring wingers and that was because of those younger players Capo Caco and uh, Lafreniere um, just not really amounting to what the expectation is at this point so they trade for Kane they trade for Tarasenko uh, both are gone well Kane's a free agent so I guess he could still be an option but Blake Wheeler was the only, I, I'm going to say he was the only addition who you could say, all right, he may fit into the top six on the wing. Um, Bonino's fine as a, a depth guy, but he's not addressing the scoring issue. So in my eyes, looking at their forwards, they should not be done. That being said, they don't have any cap space. So you, you really need uh, Blake Wheeler to still be a solid offensive player. I, I think he can be. But you really need at least one of your high-end first-round draft picks to start playing like they're a high-end first-round draft pick. Yeah, and to me, there's still a glaring issue with this roster, and it's kind of been this way. So Mika Zibanejad is a really good center. Vincent Trocek's a good second-line center, really good third-line center. Philip Heedle's probably a really good second-line center at this point. I don't love their top-line depth. Like, Artemi Panarin's a top-line player. He's a, he's a yeah, clear first-line player. <laughs> Zibanejad, Kreider, on a lot of other teams are might not be first-line players. And, like, so the depth is lacking, but also I... I still think they have a top end talent issue as well. And again, this is where you need a Lafreniere, a Kaka. Like those were first and second overall picks. Those are supposed to be your top line players to, and then I'm not having this question, but they haven't gotten there yet. And I don't know. I just, I don't see the scoring punch. I mean, they seem to manage the score, but every year these players get old, the older players get older. It, I don't know. I got questions. Yeah, I mean, so it's it's still a really solid roster. When we talk about getting into the playoffs, I could see it for sure. They, they should be a playoff team. How far they go is then the question, and I think that's where these issues really start to um, kind of limit their championship potential, at least in comparison to other playoff teams. Um Kreider's a great player. He's only going to be getting older. He's 32 right now. I don't want to say Panarin's old. He's still very, very good, but he's 31 right now. How many years do you have left of this elite, one of the best wingers in hockey play? I don't know. Um, the way this team was built, it kind of seemed like there was the expectation that those two first round picks were going to be very good. Like you said, if they started playing at that top six level, we're not having an issue here. Um, and I, I think that's, that's just really the way to sum up the Rangers defensively. They're, they're pretty solid in goal. I'd like to see a better backup than Quick, but they have one of the best goalies in hockey, Shesterkin, the number one who's going to play 60 games. It's that scoring on the wing. They, it's 
very thin. Um, Kreider and Panarin, you can get away with. Um, I shouldn't say you can get away with. Those are top six wingers, um, but they're they're missing another two top six wingers. Yeah, I yeah. When when the hope is for potentially Blake Wheeler to come in and kind of help add the offensive scoring punch, like he's still an effective player at at his age. Yeah, but. <laughs> Again, there's there's a hole there. Like they tried to play it last year with King and Tarasenko, it's just that, and it eh, that that didn't work either. And I don't know. It again, it it really comes down to those young players. I mean, that's why I've said probably the past three three years. Like, can the Rangers make the playoff a playoff run potentially if these young players take a step forward? At like they have all the other pieces, but until that happens and. They're at they're at the cap ceiling. They don't have room to add guys either. So I I I don't know. A hundred points is possible. Again, they have they have the back end to to steal some games. But I I would I would lean under here and and really I also like I don't know how comfortable I would be if you told me I have to correctly order the Rangers, Pittsburgh, and Islanders, I don't know how comfortable I would be ordering those teams. To me, there are three teams that easily could finish right around the same range. I mean, I know I said the Islanders, I bet the under, but like if, if they finish, all of them finish between 93 and 96 points, that would not surprise me whatsoever in some order. And I think, so I think those are the three, clear three middle teams. I think there's three teams at the bottom, Philadelphia, Columbus, Washington, in some order. Philadelphia probably last, Columbus, Washington, fighting for the next two spots. With the, uh, Islanders, Pittsburgh Rangers next. And then there's two definite top teams in the division, possibly across the entire NHL. New Jersey Devils, 104 and a half points. They are probably one going to be one of the trendy picks for overs, deep playoff runs, presidents' trophies. Yeah. Um, so once we start getting over a hundred points, and it doesn't seem like it's well over, but from a hockey standpoint, a hundred and four and a half, so one hundred and five points. That's pretty significant. Um, so just in that sense, it makes me uncomfortable, but I think I lean towards the over with New Jersey. Um, forward group is one of the best forward groups, if not the best, in hockey. Um, defensively, they lost one of their more long-term players, Damon Severson. I think they're still fairly solid defensively. Um, there is, I think, a question mark with, like, how great is Luke Hughes going to be right out of the gate? Because um, he, he's going to have to play top four minutes. Um, so th there's a question mark there. I do think there's also a question mark with the goalies. Um, that was one of the big expected moves was New Jersey's got to go find their number one. Uh, everyone, including us, kept saying, well, that'd be a great spot for Hellebuck. Didn't happen, or at least it hasn't happened yet. Um, I think their goalies are solid enough that they're going to go into the playoffs very easily. It is, if you had to pick a spot to improve on the team, you probably look there. Um, but overall, to me, this offense is just so, so strong. And there's good depth there throughout the third line. And I, I, I just I think they're going to get to 105. They're the first team that I think we can say, oh, well, if a couple things go wrong, that they can still overcome. I think a lot of the other teams that we've talked about in this division need things to go right for them. I think the Devils can still overcome a level of things going wrong. Like, okay, Luke Hughes struggles out of the gate while they just outscore teams. Like, not not a problem. Or goalies are a problem. Again, outscore the teams. 
an injury up front, they maybe, but Luke Hughes does, like, takes a step forward, okay, they're probably fine there. Like, there's just, there's a lot of combinations for them where I think they can potentially offset an issue and be okay. As you said, I don't know if there's a better forward group, at least, like, their top six is unbelievable. Meyer, Jack Hughes, Jesper Braun, Nico Heischer, and then we got Andre Pollat and Tyler Toffoli, Dawson Mercer. Like, that's more than six guys that on most teams would be top six players. Again, defense, I mean, Dougie Hamilton's clear number one defenseman. John Marino had a really nice year last year, so maybe he's he's doing, he's found a spot there. It really is probably going to come down to to an extent. Luke Hughes, Simon ne- Nekic, Nemich, Nemich, sorry. Yeah, I, I want to toss in one more name that I think is fairly underrated. Uh, Jonas Siegenthaler. I think he's going to be a very similar player to Ryan Graves for them. He kind of was Ryan Graves' light in a lighter, smaller amount of minutes this past year. Um just from a play style perspective, it would make perfect sense for him to assume the Ryan Graves stay-at-home defenseman, strong defensive play role. Um, so even though they lost Graves as well as Severson, I think Siegenthaler should be able to move up the lineup and fill at least Graves' spot. Um, but yeah, yeah they, they could improve defensively. I think they're still solid there. Um, couple things popped into my mind. I want to mention going into the off season. I think there was a lot of questions about whether or not they'd be able to keep both Timo Meyer and Jesper Bratt, and they did, which is part of why that top six is amazing. The other thing I wanted to mention, you kind of hinted at this. I, I think they are able to overcome an injury here and there. They're just that deep of a team, especially offensively. Another factor in that, this number doesn't sound like a lot. They have 1.9 million in cap space. Doesn't sound like a lot. That's more than, I don't know the exact number, but pretty much half the league has. If someone gets hurt, they're going to have a little bit of an easier time maneuvering and possibly being able to bring someone else in through a trade, especially around a deadline season, trade deadline season. Um, it might not be a huge star player, but I think they'll have room if they feel they need to, they could bring in a middle six forward, a, maybe a second pair of defensemen, um, maybe even a goalie. So, just from a talent perspective, they've already got it. And I, I think, even though it doesn't seem like a lot, that 1.9 in cap space, they're in a much more advantageous position than many contenders. Yeah, they should easily be able to stay out of using long-term injured reserve for, for, for the season unless things really go south for them. And that's going to allow them, as as the deadline starts to roll, roll around, that's going to allow them to add a fairly high cap hit if they desire at some position. So if, yeah, if defense or goalie isn't cutting it, it, they they easily are going to have the space to swing a move without needing a middleman, without needing to do some other maneuvering. Like, yeah, that that's a big factor. They can easily buy buy at the deadline, no no hesitation. I I mean if you're if you're looking for kind of sleeper players on like a in a fantasy league just draft devil forwards like yeah. a- a- any of yeah. them just just draft them like you you should be fine those those guys are going to put up a lot of points and then some of the defensemen as a result are also going to get points like Dougie Hamilton and Luke Hughes like the, those guys are going to get probably a lot of points so those those guys are on my would be on my radar I will I like the over bet for the Devils and I kind of like I hinted at it a little bit they might be someone I might put a couple dollars on as a president's trophy yeah. uh, contender because I, their their odds are long enough where it's interesting, but and I think they have one of the stronger overall rosters in the league and really have some of the top scoring punch among everyone. Yeah, I want to throw out one more player from a fantasy perspective. 
beginning of the off season, um, I would have said this player, Tyler Toffoli, um, real good player. Probably don't expect 34 goals, 39 assists, 73 points again. Gets traded to the New Jersey Devils. He's probably playing with, well, he's guaranteed to play with one of Jack Hughes, Jesper Bratt, and Timo Meyer. Well, I, I guess he's not guaranteed. I don't, I'm pretty sure they're going to split those three up um, based on how they had him play last year. And even if not, I guess we can throw in another name, Nico Hishier, as the fourth guy there that he has a chance to play with. Someone like that who might have initially been kind of viewed as, all right, we expect him to regress a little bit. Just switching teams to New Jersey, he might not. Um, so that, that, that's kind of another one I, I would keep an eye on from a fantasy perspective. Yeah, if you if you one of your centers is is either Jack Hughes or Nico Heischer, and you're probably getting power play time with them, plus potentially Dougie Hamilton and or Luke Hughes, um, I think you're going to do just fine putting up point totals. So I like the Devils as the over. Again, I'd even for a little interesting, and it's and they're an easy team to kind of root for as well because they play such an offensive style. I might sprinkle a few dollars on them winning the president's trophy as well for the most points in the regular season. And then another team that's going to be right in that team conversation is the, is the other team in the Metro whose point totals a little bit higher, but not that much. So Carolina hurricanes, one Oh five and a half points. They brought in Dimitri Orlov this off season to add to their blue line, kept their goalie situation intact, which was interesting that that was their kind of decision to make and then I like the fit of Michael Bunting in their forward group a lot and I think he could maybe be a little bit of a difference maker for a team that at times lacks some scoring punch yeah I I think Bunting was a great addition I I think they kind of needed that extra winger there um to specifically touch on the scoring punch when Svechnikov went down uh, last year, I believe that was an ACL. They really missed him at the end of the year and in the playoffs, and I think they kind of, in a lot of people's eyes, went from possibly the, a favorite or the favorite for the Cup to, well, wait a minute, they're pretty much their best goal scorer is on the sidelines. That's not easy to deal with. That being said, he's a young player. Timeline-wise, he should be back, ready to go. Um, Maybe if not quite right at the start of the season, he shouldn't miss too much time. Um, I, I look at this roster, and I don't really see a hole that I need to fill. Um, and I I almost feel a little bit more comfortable than even New Jersey. I don't know if I put this, um, forward group ahead from an offensive standpoint, from a defensive standpoint, looking at the forwards, I think I like Carolina better. I think all around play, their forwards are a little bit better. Defensively, I'm a little more comfortable with Carolina. And I'm honestly going to say in goal, I think I'm a little more comfortable. The Running the three goalies can be a little weird. I think it really worked for them, um, specifically because Freddie Anderson and Antti Ranta both have their injury concerns. Limiting the amount of games they play, I think, has helped as far as their productiveness. And honestly, the third goalie that I have not mentioned, uh, Peter Kachikov, he was good last year in the games he got. He's a young goalie. I would expect a step forward from him. Um, So I think there's potential for that goalie situation to work out even better than it did last year. Yeah, I I don't know how much more really to add to that. I. I worry a little bit about their. I still worry a little bit about their ability to score goals. Um, 
I mean, Shrestikov coming back should should improve that. I again, Bunting, I like to add some scoring punch, but they don't have that clear like we're gonna count on this guy 30, 40 goals. They don't have that guy. I mean, Aho's good, really good as well. You're hoping a Nekas or Seth Jarvis maybe start to put the puck in the neck a little bit more, but that's that's really my concern. Like, I guess Rastrikov is you you're hoping for thirty goals from, but like even asking for forty from him seems like a maybe a stretch. I don't know who else is going to be in that range either. So if they can win close games, yeah, um, I will. I mean, I. I still like their roster a lot. They're still an easy, they're still almost the playoff lock, in my opinion. I think I'd lean the over here. To me, though, I don't know if they quite have the potential to win that President's Trophy. So I think I think the Devils have a higher ceiling where the Hurricanes have a higher floor. So, yeah. But both both really, really solid teams. I don't know. I, I like I like both them. I probably lean the over for the Hurricanes, but not. I don't feel overly comfortable because, as you mentioned, for the Devils, like starting to get 105, 106 points. That's a lot of points, and it seems like oh, it's it happens. It like that's starting to push point totals that really don't happen a ton. Exactly, and I, I want to be clear. This isn't. A team that offensively is on the level of like the Islanders, where it's like they're just a shutdown team. Carolina has much better offensive uh, ability than a team like the Islanders, but that being said, it's not on the level of the New Jersey Devils. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of like what you were saying. Uh, it's not a comfortable choice to make this over and under um at 105 and a half i i myself lean towards the over um but i'm not comfortable doing so so if i were to actually um decide i wanted to do that i would probably stay if i actually decided i wanted to to look at these over and unders and make some financial decisions there and try and earn a little extra cash. I don't think I'm comfortable doing that with Carolina. Yeah, I, they're they're the close one. I mean, so to me, to me in the division, Columb- I feel a little more comfortable. Columbus as an over. I kind of like New Jersey as an over. Rangers, I think we both like as an under. And then the other teams, like Philly probably hits under it under but the other teams I don't know like again like it depends depends on to- risk tolerance and all that stuff but like if I'm making smart decisions I might stay away from half of these teams yeah and I, I think that just it speaks to the strength of the division um, and even the Eastern Conference is there's there's a lot of different outcomes here that would not surprise us And that is probably a great kind of wrap to the Metropolitan Division with the Atlantic finishing up that Eastern Conference we just referenced coming in the next episode. Um, Any thoughts, any questions, anything, want want a further explanation or opinion on certain players, feel free at AFP Analytics, direct messages, tweet us. You can find our personal Twitter accounts there as well. And um, with that, we'll talk to you next time.